is a Ludwig 1969 Psychedelic Red set. 14 by 20, 9 by 13, 16 by 16. And then we have the Rogers Dynasonic Wood Snares, which is a reissue. And between you and me, I'm not usually that big on reissues. But they did something right with this snare. It actually sounds pretty good. So this kick drum, these toms, great little set of drums. Notice I set it up wow. left-handed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, actually, because of you, I can actually keep a beat on a left-handed drum Thank set. Thank you. Right, for all, after all, all this time. All these times I've and... had to get sound setting up your drums, I, I got my <laughs> left foot. I'm using that side of my brain now. <laughs> Today, we've got Joey Warnaker, and uh, I'm just so happy he could do it. He is one of my dearest friends, and... And uh, we've been on so many outings together. It's just, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you lose track, actually. Yeah, you know? I know. No, it's crazy. I know I'm honored to be here for this. No, I know. So I'm, I'm remembering, the. I think, one of the first big, bigger recording sessions I did mm -hmm. for the Smashing Pumpkins record, Adore. Uh-huh. Um, and I just showed up. And Sylvia Massey was the engineer, and Rick Rubin was producing, and the drums were there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even know if I barely had any drums at that point. Right. And I'll just never forget it. It was this kit set up, and I'm looking, and this, the snare drum is a something I didn't know really know about, and it looked like it was going to explode when I hit it. It was a 15 by 5 brass Ludwig with, you know, like the, from the twenties with the straight hoops and the claws. And, and I was like, this is like a gigantic rock song. Like how, how right. is this possibly going to work? And anyway, and then I found out that, that, you know, they were your drums and that you had, I don't know how you had figured out that that would be like a drum that would produce such a massive sound. A lot of times with Sylvia, Sylvia is one of the one of the coolest people in the world. Yes. Uh, she would basically say, this is what we're doing, this is kind of the vibe we're going for. And I just have experiences with the different drums. So on that session, I probably had five or six snares. Yeah. And I, you know, I kind of, they'll, sometimes they'll play me a track and I'll say, yeah, let's, let's take that old 1920s 15 inch and mm -hmm. muffle it up and tune it down and, Basically, it's all about what it sounds like through the mics is really what it comes down to. Yeah, I feel I, I learned that was the beginning for me. I learned so much that that day. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's go back to the beginning. What was what was if you can remember? Yeah. What was the, the reason you started playing drums? Do you remember? Oh, that? sure. Um, I was apparently hitting things for from like the time you could hit the things the time I could hit things <laughs> right. um and uh it became more like a <clears throat> a formal like like I had some some lessons when I was probably I want to 9 or 10 mm -hmm. something like that from my um my uncle who's an amazing drummer he saw that whenever I would whenever I would like go over to kids houses and they had a drum set mm -hmm. I couldn't play the drum set right. and I was becoming very frustrated because all I did at home all day was like make drum sets out of pillows or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he know, he said, well, you know what? You're playing left-handed. So he set up a drum set left-handed and showed me some basic, like how you hold the sticks and, and a few rudiments. And then he gave me Led Zeppelin IV and the... Uh, the Pink Panther soundtrack. <laughs> why, why that? I can understand Led Zeppelin IV, but, but why the Pink Panther soundtrack? I know, there's just, just for, I think, the for a very basic <clears throat> um, and kind of easily digestible, um, like, swing. But yeah, so those two things. That's, and that's I cool. And I think, yeah, and I think Led Zeppelin IV, I... When he came back the next week, and I, you know, was had just been playing to the album sure. over and over again, and and the the Pink Panther a little bit, 
but you know, but then anyway, then that that was that was it. And when I was older, like eighteen, um, I took lessons mm -hmm. again, and I I actually you know what I did, I looked in the I I thought I want to study with my favorite drummer who was Jim Keltner, and so I looked him up in the musicians union, which you could do very easily. And I got a phone number and I called the number and it was his voicemail. I didn't know how it worked then, but I was like, I thought it would be, you know, some agency or something like that. Right. And uh, lo and behold, like a day or two later, I the phone rings and I answer it and you know, hey, this is Jim Kelton, but, you know, we're chatting and it's so amazing. And he said, you know, I'm not a teacher, but I'm going to recommend you to the teacher. And it was uh, Freddie Gruber. So you took lessons with Freddie. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an experience in itself. He's the best educator. I, I think I never had a better teacher than him um, in school or any, well, like I went to college. I there mm -hmm. were Part of the problem was I none of the professors I had could touch him in terms of his like raw ability to convey information even though he could you know he was the most gruff insane person <laughs> but you but you're a better person for having been next to him and being being close to him because absolutely because he he brought his uh, experience and he had a hell of a life he had a hell I mean, of a life I, I took lessons from him too and oh. yeah, and it was one okay. of these things where I, oh, well, here's, here's a great story. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking lessons from him. He had a little Camco set of drums in the back room, right? Mm -hmm. With those pads on, those big black pads, right, on the drums. Uh-huh. And we're starting the lesson. Uh-huh. And about 10 minutes into the lesson, someone rings his door, <laughs> his doorbell. Uh-huh. And he goes, excuse me, I, I'm expecting somebody. So he leaves me in the room. And he's gone for, it felt like 15 minutes. And I'm thinking, about, I'm paying this guy like whatever it was, $75 an hour. Oh, yeah. And he's gone for 15 minutes. Yeah. So after a minute, after a while, I start going, what the, what the hell's going on here? So I take the pads off the drums. Uh-huh. I just start, <laughs> I start going for it. Like, hey, I'm back here. You hear me back around playing drums back here, you know? Okay. So the door opens and it's not Freddie. Nope. It's Buddy Rich. Yeah, I knew exactly where that was going. <laughs> Buddy Rich comes into the room, and I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, yeah. I'm like what if, what? He, go, he goes, sounds like you're having a goddamn seizure back here. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I mean, I'm, Buddy Rich was like one of the reasons I started playing drums. I used to see him on, like, The Tonight Show, and he used to have, like, you know, dueling drummers with him and Louis Belson or him and Sammy Davis Jr. Mm -hmm. So he was one of my heroes. Yeah. And he shows up and he asked me the same kind of question. He goes, So are you uh you gonna are you gonna be a drummer or are you or is this, you know, you're uh are, or it's like what are you doing here, yeah. kid? You know? And I said, I said, man, I'm trying to be the best drummer I can be. I've got a I'm in a band, I'm playing, I'm trying to trying to get to a point where I'm making my, my money doing this. He goes, okay. So he sits down on one side, and Freddie comes back and sits down on the other side. And they gave me, like, like I was there with them for about 90 minutes. Yeah. And just trying to soak up everything I could. And then I was the butt of every joke. They're like, I sure hope you have a day job, kid. And, right. And all that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. You, all, yeah, it's like, you're, it's like, you're never, you're never going to be a drummer, man. You bet, I hope you have a day job. And... And he went on and on. So finally, finally, he ha Buddy has to leave, right? And Freddie comes back in the room. He goes, he goes, do you realize what just happened? Uh, he goes, that was a miracle. Uh, he goes, Buddy sat down with you for for ninety minutes. For yeah. ninety minutes, he goes, he goes, he goes, he never does that. Yeah. I said, oh my god. He goes, he goes, he goes. Most drummers would give their right arm for to just be in a room with the guy, much less having a lesson from him. I said, whoa, it was painful as hell. <laughs> right, yeah. You had to put up <laughs> I, felt, I felt like I, I learned a lot of lessons besides just playing drums. But uh, they, they really, between the two of them, it really toughens you up, makes, makes you realize that it's, it's about the life. 
of the drummer. Yeah, and that is that is the that's the penultimate Freddie story. Oh my God. Yeah, my thing was he. I was his uh, when 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 I was talking with him. He, I, th- I and I, I'm convinced he did this on purpose. Um, I would get there at about five thirty or six, which was the earliest I think I could get there after school, <clears throat> and he would immediately send me to the deli. He sent you to the deli. Yeah, to pick up his his, his order. Yeah, the soup. Right. The like rugulas, the Las Vegas cookies, all mm-hmm. this stuff, and. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and I remember finally there was <laughs> one of those lessons where I was like, you know, it's like about to be midnight, and I lost, I lost it, and I was like, man, I got homework, I got to go to school in the morning. Like, what are you doing to me, man? Like, right. I live with my parents. This is out of control, dude. And he was like, he's like, don't be a drummer then. Don't be a musician. Like, you're gonna show up to a gig and be like, okay, um, I've gotta be home, uh, my mom's waiting for me, and you know, his whole <laughs> Freddy thing, which I was like, oh, that's, that's a dumb excuse. But, but he was actually right, because like, the, one of the great talents as a musician is to be able to wait. And, and roll with it. And roll with it and be positive. Yeah. And, uh, and, the other thing was he he was he he was making I mean probably for all, he knew he wanted everyone to like see each other and you know like I mean you got Buddy Rich but I would get other students who would come in and and I'd be like cool it's my lesson and he, oh he's gonna watch my lesson that's great and then be like no 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 you need to see him do his lesson before we can do our lesson today because you're and you'll you'll know why. And I would, and it was true, every time. It was so much more than just the technique that I got from. So much from, more, right? Yeah, you, that's not. I know it was it's like, like a talk, life lesson. Talk it, life lesson. Yes, yes. I mean, I got it. Got. I mean, it, he, yeah. He gave me advice about everything, which was, you know, and I would say to myself, like, take everything with a grain of salt. This is a. This person is completely insane. <laughs> She was, but but in retrospect, his he he really was this crazy kind of like sensei. He really did. Yeah. He just, God bless him. He like he could tell you what you need to hear, but he even could, though you didn't think you wanted to hear it, and especially, but he could not take care of himself or make a probably good decision for himself. This is great. Um, I'm really I'm really happy that. Uh, that we could do this and, and, and that we can remember the stuff that we've done. I know, I know. <laughs> well, I, f- I find that I have a f- I have such a c- sort of ridiculous selective memory, like, a, you know, I'll be, be talking to people I wor- play with or whatever, like, who <clears throat> can, you know, rem- remember the, when we did the whatever festival in that crazy town in Spain, I'm like, no. Right. But I can remember, like, you know, the, like, a wear a piece of tape and was put on a drum and, <laughs> and how. Right, right, right. Like, Selective memory. I like seeing, I got to see Jeff Picaro record when I was a little kid. And I'll never forget that. Gretsch drums. And like he tuned them, tuned them up himself. And like <clears throat> tissue paper with, it had to be like the, the beige masking tape, the certain... Thickness. What year was that, do you think? Um, that sounds like it was before my time with Jeff. Yeah, probably like 1980. That was right before my time. Not 79, 80. Like yeah. I was a little kid, but I remember that very, very clearly. I think you told, told me a story because I've been playing with Roger Waters about, and, you know, like Jeff played on Mother, which is like, you know, on, from the wall, one of the, like, the. Yep. it's definitely one of my favorite like for a, just a tasteful, subtle uh, performance. Talk about tasteful and subtle. I think you may have the crown for that. Oh, well. Um, and if anybody hasn't seen the Roger Waters tour, if they get a chance to see it, it again, uh, check out Joey in that. That is, that is, that gig was made for you, or you were oh. made for that gig. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you fit in, you fit in that. 
I couldn't imagine anybody fitting into that, that seat better than you. Well, thanks. I mean, besides the, the, the normal, you know, excitement of just going out on a, on a, a tour that basically you guys probably kill it every night. The crowd probably goes crazy every night. So there's, so there's a certain amount of excitement b behind that. Was there anything that was like crazy that happened or any wild stories you can think of on that tour? I mean, the main thing is that uh, Roger is so uh, extreme in his politics. <laughs> and um, we were touring in Brazil and we were touring right at the time of the elections. Down there. Yeah. And he, I mean, I was really proud. It was, I was like, this is amazing. He was doing everything in his power to put out sort of a, you know, the idea of like, you don't have to vote for Bolsonaro. So he's real political. He's not kidding around. Yeah. Well, it got to the point where, you know, we, that we were told if he, you know, if he didn't, cool it that we would all be arrested and there was all that kind of stuff and like every day <laughs> there'd be like one or two more security mm -hmm. people on our tour and our crew and it was it was intense so the government was basically threatening roger oh yeah and the tour was getting so much publicity so much press mm -hmm. it was actually looked like it was making i mean it made a small dent but it was making a an impression and and there was actually a law that the night, I think the eve of, of voting, we were playing a show and no, no one, no public uh, uh, media source or anyone do, doing anything in public was allowed to talk about politics after 10 p.m. And so of course, Roger did this thing where he went on an anti-Bolsonaro thing at like, 9.59 with, a, like, the seconds counting down. <laughs> wow. And um, anyway. It's very yeah. ballsy. It was scary, yeah. There were a lot of times where I was, like, to my drum tech, I was like, could you, could you maybe, like, make the symbols a little more, like, vertical and, like... <laughs> so they don't see you. <laughs> they don't see me or, like, in case there's gunfire. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was cool. It was really cool. But, yeah, that was the... That was the craziness on that tour. Otherwise, it was it was extremely civilized. Out of most of the drummers that I know, I think you have one of the most distinctive playing styles that that I can think of. There's, oh, thanks. It's true. I mean, first of all, I can't think of anybody who has as light of a touch as you. Ah. And and you groove. So you've you've got that deep pocket, mm -hmm. and it's not like you're. You know, you're slamming it. It's like you have that deep pocket, like, it's kind of like Charlie Watts, the way you can play light mm -hmm. and and still have that pocket and, and still propel it. I think that your style is, is very unique. And, oh, and thanks, man. I was wondering, is, is, there, is that uh, intentional or is it just that you, that's the way you hear it? Or how, how did you come around to the way you do it? Oh, thanks, man. Um, I, re well... I do think a couple things happened. Well, like be, being that my first band when I was a teenager was like this crazy Western swing band. <laughs> I had to play quiet. I had to play really quietly. And I, so I learned how to play quietly. And, and I actually, and I got in a, I was in a jazz, school jazz band. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the teacher, I think he, I think he had, um, uh, what, what do you call it when, when you have a uh, ear ear ish uh, um, tinnitus? I think he had tinnitus. So he didn't like loud. He wouldn't. Sounds. He would only. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, Western swing. I know how to play really quietly. So he would only let me play drums, which is because I was the only drummer who could actually like tone it down. Tone it down, and I got so good at playing quietly. And then cut to me being in like my rock band when I was a teenager and we were almost like kind of like post-punk arty rock band in the early, early 90s. And I, my, I have such a great memory of like touring clubs, mm -hmm. small clubs without a sound man using the house sound guy. And 
checking the snare drum and this one sound guy going like, hit the, hit the drum harder. I'm like hitting the drum and I can tell it's not going to the house. He's like, hit the drum. You're not hitting the drum. I'm like, turn your gate off. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna hit that. This is as hard as I'm gonna hit it. You need right. to turn your gate down or right. off. Like, if you have your gate on, there's no snare in this, in this PA, right. period. Right. And I think I quickly got over my insecurity of being like, oh, I can't hit the drums hard enough. I'm not a good, I'm not a good drummer. I can't hit the drums hard enough to, over to like, wait a minute, I have my own style. It's okay. Everything's going to work. And <coughs> it, it certainly followed me around. Well, a little, I was insecure about it when I was younger. And, and I definitely had those experiences of like, even even as I was getting noticed and getting hired to do things like, you know, being replaced by like, you know, a real drummer who could you know actually hit the drums and all that stuff and and I just kind of kind of like kept going and and then at a certain point it turned around and people were like do do your thing. We want you for what you do, and we don't. We don't even want to tell you, give you any direction because you're here for your sound. And so it, it de- but it took. I would say it took me in a, a solid ten years to be confident. But like I came up around a lot of like you know it was like the big rock time, and I would be playing on these giant rock records, and a lot of times <laughs> be like, why are you playing? You know there be a someone would be there going like, why, why is this guy playing on this song? This is outrageous. He mm-hmm. can't even fucking hit the drums. And, um, and for, yeah, fortunately I just kept my wits and I'm like, I'm not gonna, cause I realized I could have gone home and just learned how to hit the drums hard. That's not rocket science. Right. I could have done that mm-hmm. easily. Um, but uh, anyway, here we are. <laughs> you know, I, I can't remember that many times because I, mean, I was a lot of times I'm setting you up for uh-huh. the for the session. Yeah, and most times a producer and engineer can they can figure it out. Oh yeah. So so somebody who's basically saying you're not hitting the drums hard enough, th- there's something lacking on their side. I agree. No, and there was a point where, I mean, I had to be way more mature. Not when I was in my twenties, right. but. But yeah, where I would sometimes I'd walk in, I'd look up, I'd be like, the overheads are really high, mm-hmm. and they'd play me. What's going on? I'd be like, you know that I don't hit the drums like this, like mm-hmm. X, Y, or Z drummers. Like you, you might have the wrong person. Mm-hmm. Just like let's get this out of the way now, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to be smashing the snare drum. Right. You know, uh, and um, uh, yeah, and I do. I do my thing, but the crazy thing is when it, when someone knows and knows how to deal with it and goes like, you know, oh yeah, listen to Led Zeppelin, listen to, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix records or whatever, like listen to Cream. They're, these were finesse drummers. And that's what I, that's what I also came up with. And, and ooh. Um, uh, it's raining. It's interesting you bring up John Bonham with, with Led Zeppelin because everybody, I mean, a lot of people will come to me and say, hey, I want, a, I want a Led Zeppelin drum sound. Yeah. And I can bring them the drums. I can tune them the, the right way. I know what heads to put on them. I know what cymbals to put up. But a lot of people don't realize that John Bonham was not hitting the drums that that hard. He was a finesse player. Yeah. And and he he was like a big band drummer. He had chops, I and mean, that's you yeah. you can't do those fills and all that stuff hitting the drums that hard. I mean, all those triplets and all that stuff. That's that's somebody who had a lot of technique, and and he wasn't expending his energy to to do those triplets. He he just had it in his in his hands. I love watching him play. I know it's like, it's it's such a lesson. He really did have touch and technique and. Mm-hmm. And sure, sometimes he lays in, but you can tell it's like, oh, they're having, he's having fun and it's that part of the show. And then you see he's like choked up on the stick. You see it's like, yeah, 
he's like hitting harder and he's pulling the stick back so he's not laying in as hard. Right. And you watch him like, and the hi hat, he's, he's like, he's never like killing the hi hats. He was all, he's like mixing himself. Exactly. I was just about to say that. Even when he's having, even when he's just like lost, he's, so anyway, yeah, I love it. It's so important that people have their own voice and that they're, that they're individual and, and that's really what it's about instead of trying to be, you know, John Bonham. It's not like you got to be you. You got you got to explore what you do, make it be different. I agree. No, and and I know that's that's like the key to me. I know and even when I'm like working or even just doing a session with like a younger artist <coughs> a particular like when I when I hear the, the the self-doubt I'm always like how do how do I say that in a way that's you know how do I I gotta say it you know mm -hmm. like just do your do your thing yeah. don't worry the more the more you, the, the more you are authentically yourself the better like in general and but even in pop music I mean I mean like the ones I love like the artists who are, I mean, even now, like someone like Billie Eilish, like totally authentic. Um, but, you know, you know, the big, the big records are always the ones that were like the most sort of like honest mm -hmm. and where people are. Yeah. So that's, but for sure with musicians, oh my God. I have one more question. Okay. Um, what makes a good groove? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good one that's like one of the un that's like a zen like unanswerable um <coughs> i know to me that it is like a zen thing it's like a weird like spiritual unanswerable question um because like for a long time i thought a good groove is when the rhythm section is locking in with each other <laughs> mm -hmm. done right and like as long as they're you know with some amount of like fluidity but then i had the experience of being hired to play percussion um to um sort of an older funk drummers like groove mm -hmm. nothing was was laying in in the rest of the track but the producer was convinced is like if you can just somehow like play a shaker that follows this crazy lopsided groove of this old drummer it's going to be magic and um and i was like oh my god he's right and i did say you're you i think you should get the bass player who's amazing to he should just come in and do the same thing it'll be better but the this groove that this guy had was i mean to this day i was like i don't know where that comes from it's, so you're saying the drummer had a great groove but the rest yeah, of the band didn't didn't lock with him yeah so you were there to sort of smooth bridge it. just kind of smooth it over between the rest of the band and, yeah. and the drummer with with the percussion yeah and it didn't well at least to me it didn't matter that the the guitar could be off a little bit because the guitar was a bit more <clears throat> melodic, mm -hmm. but the ba the bass needed to. I was like, man, if you lock the bass in and the guitar's a little loose, it's gonna sound perfect. Right. But I was like, this the it is there is some weird spiritual, unexplainable thing that makes the groove good, and I think it's the same with Led with like Bonham. It's like you you can listen to his drum tracks without the rest of the band, which are, I guess, probably still on YouTube. But um, I'm like, it just feels so good and it's unexplainable. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't know. That's my take on it. What do you think? <laughs> well, I think that I think that uh, self confidence comes into play. Oh yeah. I yeah, think yeah. I think a drummer who comes in and says. Okay, this is where this this is where it should be, and it's a, it's oh. a it's a, a drummer needs to have rhythm. I love that. 
and 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 I remember like Procaro was it's a perfect guy for this because yeah. if, if you knew anything about Jeff, you knew that he was he was a very confident guy. He would come in and he'd have this this really positive vibe and come in just like, oh, this is gonna be fun. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna nail this today. Yeah. And he'd come in and just be like, This is where it is. You mm -hmm. know, right there. And and everybody was like, He's right. <laughs> he just had it. He knew, yeah, you know. He knew. So it's it's a it's a confidence thing, and I think a lot of it comes from experience as well. I think you get the confidence from experience, but uh, I think I think the way you come up or you understand what what pocket is, uh -huh. and I think the deeper your pocket, the better it is. It's that simple. Yeah, if you feel like you have it and you're doing it, and it's like yeah, just own it and be confident yeah don't let anybody mess with it or don't feel don't feel uh uh um don't second guess it i guess i agree i just <clears throat> watched like a you know some 11 year olds play mm -hmm. <laughs> and this kid this one kid was you know like the standout and just laying down the simple like quarter note kick kick snare kind of thing and but he had that crazy thing where he, I could tell he knew the song and he was just like, he was, le he was driving the ship. And mm -hmm. I was like, that's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And his pocket was perfect at 11. Yeah. See, that's talent. Yeah. He kind of feels where it's supposed to be. He doesn't have to be taught that. No. And, and the confidence was, was really interesting. It's mm -hmm. like, it was like that was kind of what set him apart from everyone else as well. I mean, he was better, let's be honest. But, but um, you know, he wasn't shy at all. Right. And I was almost like that. that's kind of the lesson that these kids should get. It's like, you know, don't be too cool. Like, let yourself, like, get into it and, you know, be dorky about it and and be confident. Right. And, you know, that, like, you don't have to be, like, you know, you can actually, like, move and, like, look around and be into it. It, it takes, I think it takes most people, especially when you're young, it takes people a little while to get that confidence. And, and the more experience you have doing it, like, you know, maybe, maybe this 11-year-old practiced every day or maybe he was maybe he was like you when you were small and he, yeah he always was tapping you know that's what yeah i actually i i was talking to the his dad who's, mm -hmm. and, and yeah and he was like oh my god that's all it's all he does yeah so so you're either either you're a drummer or you're not yes <laughs> yes when 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 parents ask me about it i they say you think my, my kid's going to be a drummer i said there's one there's one question that I ask him. I said, do you have to ask him to stop playing? <laughs> because that tells the whole story right there. Yeah. If if the kid if you have to if you have to bug him to practice, he's not a drummer. Yeah. If you have to bug him to stop playing, he's a drummer. And God help you. <laughs> I know. I know. Exactly. <laughs> I know you have to get on to a gig, which is uh which I, I totally expected it <laughs> but uh, I really want to thank you for coming out I really appreciate you yeah. coming out but I want to uh, can I check it out it's so gorgeous 